And that includes order questions to the Minister of Health. We now move to topical questions. After question time. The, 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 <laughs> and we move on to topical questions to the Minister of Health. Question number one has been withdrawn. Judith Cotton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the serious nature of the claims made against um, Cherry Tree Nursing Home and the RQIA, when does the Minister intend to bring forward a statement about the nature of the investigation to ensure that the public are aware of any actions that are being taken? Well, I'm very happy to bring that forward whenever RQIA have, have completed their, their course of work. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the investigation um, into the actions um, against the regulator are actually being undertaken by other employees of the same body. Does the Minister think that an investigation by the RQIA into the RQIA is independent or objective? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I could comment further on, 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 on that, that happening in other places, but I'll refrain. Uh, in terms of um, independence uh, regulation of healthcare, it certainly is a big issue. And I'm very happy for independent regulation of healthcare. I think that it's important that there is uh, independent regulation. And we fund RQIA, uh, but RQIA are responsible for their own actions and activities. Uh, so we don't give them direction as to what to do. And I've been looking at other areas and look at, for example, the, the Care Quality Commission. Um, it's actually a non-departmental body of the United Kingdom government, established in 2009. And whilst it describes itself as an independent regulator of all health and social care services in England, it is in fact accountable to the public through Parliament and the Secretary of State for Health. And again, much of its funding comes from the taxpayer. In Scotland, a public body was created in April uh, 2011, and it's part of the Scottish National Health Service, and its function is to implement the health care priorities of the Scottish Government in particular the health care quality strategy of NHS in Wales. There is an independent inspectorate and the regulator of all health care in Wales. But again, it carries out its functions on behalf of Welsh ministers. So, I have to admit, it is a challenge to get a body which is wholly independent of government, because the truth is, who is going to pay for it? And you know, People will always be of the opinion, he who pays a paper calls the tune. I genuinely want independent regulation because I think that it is good to keep um, everybody um, aware that, that that can be carried out and to keep people on top of their game. But the most important aspect is that culturally people should be wanting to do their best everywhere that they work for people that they care for. And culture is more important than regulation in that respect. Sandra Oberan. Mrs. Oberan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, could, could the Minister detail how his department measures safe staffing levels across our hospitals and detail any shortages there might be in Antrim Area Hospital? Well, uh, certainly in, in terms of staffing levels, uh, we, we have a, a means of identifying the numbers of staff that we should have in our facilities and we seek to uphold them. Uh, we have different numbers of people in wards at different times. Uh, and we have different challenges uh, in our hospitals. And on some occasions, um, those people who are on the ground will decide to pull people from one ward um, into another ward where there are particular pressures. Uh, and that is a natural course that happens. I should say that the feedback that I have been getting on Antrim Area Hospital um, over the course of the last number of months in particular has been so much more positive than was the case in the past. And uh, I think that we all need to recognise that and give some praise and, uh, to, to all of the people that are involved in delivering the service uh, that they are currently delivering. Uh, I think that the, the difference has been fundamental. And uh, in terms of, of normative staffing levels for nurses, uh, that's something that our uh, Chief Nursing Officer uh, has carried work out on. And uh, she is the person who is responsible for ensuring and that we have the appropriate number of nurses uh, in our hospitals. 
thank you very much and I thank the Minister for that response. I understand that England is bringing in mandatory recording of safe staffing levels within their hospitals. From discussions with hospital staff members, this is needed here too, um, not only to ensure optimum performance by nurses, midwives, consultants and every other member of staff in the hospital, but for ideal patient care. Has the Minister any plans to do so here in Northern Ireland? Well, as indicated, the Chief Nursing Officer has carried out um, a course of work on normative staffing levels for, for um, nurses. And uh, I'm delighted to say that um, over the course of the last two and a half years, we have appointed many more nurses, in fact, um, around 500 more nurses. So that's good news for the people of Northern Ireland. I'm sure the member uh, will appreciate that and maybe wants to include it in a press release that goes out in the future. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister outline the pressures that exist on the Ulster Hospital site in terms of having sufficient space to accommodate the services and departments that are required there? Well, the South Eastern Trust is in discussions with Knock Golf Club. Some people might be surprised to know regarding the acquisition of land currently leased to Knock Golf Club, adjacent to the location of the proposed emergency department and in the acute services block phase B, and uh, that may be utilised if that land was acquired uh, to provide additional car parking. Uh, it also, we also facilitated an acquisition of Torbank School, which is immediately adjacent to the hospital site. I visited the hospital site, and indeed the Member of, of Parliament for Strangford uh, has had people in lobbying me, in particular about the McDermott unit, which is the cancer unit um, for people in the South Eastern Trust. <coughs> And uh, those facilities are not fit for purpose. Uh, and frankly, I don't, uh, I'm not satisfied that people who are receiving treatment for cancer care are being treated in substandard facilities. Uh, so that's a challenge for the South Eastern Trust to resolve. Uh, the case that they're currently making is that they do just, just don't have the space on the Ulster Hospital site uh, to accommodate uh, a new facility uh, for the McDermott unit. And what I have been saying to the Trust very clearly is that the South Eastern Trust provides service, services for the people across the South Eastern Trust area, and many of them will be at the main site, which is at the Ulster Hospital. There may be services which they would be better providing on some of the other sites that the Ulster Hospital have. So you've got the old Bangor Hospital, the old Ards Hospital, you've got the hospital in Downpatrick, and indeed you have the Lagan Valley Hospital. All of those sites offer options for further services to be carried out at those sites, enabling the key acute services uh, to be carried out at the main hospital, which is the Ulster Hospital, and ensure that the best possible facilities are available to people requiring those acute services. So I do think that the South Eastern Trust need to fundamentally look at what they're doing in terms of um, how they're using their estate and in making best use of their estate. And I certainly think that there are other areas in their estate that they could do a lot more work on um, without impacting or damaging the service that is provided uh, to people in any way, shape or form in the South Eastern Trust. I would remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Oh, sorry. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Chair, and I thank the Minister for that extensive answer. Um, would the Minister agree with me? Obviously, as a Lagan Valley uh, MLA, I will... Uh, make the argument for Lagan Valley and acute or any services that could be transferred to that hospital. And would he also agree with me that there were plans in the past for services to be transferred to that hospital? Has the Minister any idea where those plans now lie? Well, the Lagan Valley site is, is a strong site and a strong contender in that it, that it remains um, a hospital with an emergency department and has many other um, key facilities still available at that site. So whilst the Ulster Hospital is the main acute hospital in the South Eastern <coughs> Trust, uh, certainly we recognise that the Lagan Valley uh, Hospital is carrying out an excellent service, and services can be expanded in that site. And in view of the pressures that are on Ul Ulster Hospital, almost certainly should be expanded at that site. I, I don't think that it's an acceptable uh, reason, or indeed an excuse, that people from who currently use the Ulster Hospital maybe wouldn't like to travel the distance to Lagan Valley because people who currently come from the Lisburn area are expected to travel the distance to the Ulster and, as I can recall, 
It's the same distance from Lisburn to Dundonald as it is from Dundonald to Lisburn. William Humphrey. Mr. Humphrey. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what actions has he taken in recent months on the issue of abortion and, in particular, lethal fetal uh, abnormalities? Again, this is one of these uh, vexed questions that comes before us um, where it is very difficult to, to get um, the perfect answer. Uh, but we are committed to publishing the, the guidance for health professionals in termination of pregnancy at the earliest opportunity, and although this is taking longer than I had hoped. Uh, the number and the complexity of the responses received means that it will take uh, some more time before a paper can be brought to the Executive. I am mindful that in previous versions of guidance since 2004 have been successfully challenged in the courts. And further legal advice requested through the Departmental Solicitor's Office has confirmed that the revised guidelines cannot change the options available to couples facing the very difficult and emotional circumstances of lethal fetal abnormality. Any changes around lethal fetal abnormalities would require amendments to the criminal law, which is a matter for the Department of Justice, and I have written to the Minister for Justice and executive colleagues on this matter. Work is continuing on revising the guidance to take account of the responses to consultation and to reflect the existing law in a document summarising issues raised in the consultation is currently available on the Department's website. William Humphrey. Mr. Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister uh, what meetings he has had with couples affected uh, with le lethal fetal abnormalities? Well, I have met both the couples that. Um, Came into the public domain and uh, who were advised that their baby had a lethal abnormality. And I also met with the clinicians who were providing advice to the couples. And uh, I'm writing directly to both the families that I met on this issue to provide them with an update on the situation. I've also received um, a vast amount of correspondence from others who have been in similar circumstances. Uh, many of them had made a decision to actually proceed. Um, with the pregnancy, uh, because they felt that that is what they wished to do, and had received real value from, from, from going ahead with the pregnancy. Uh, but I can understand fully that there are other people who are in different circumstances, and uh, they do not feel that that uh, is the case for them. Uh, so we will try to deal as sensitively as possible with all of these issues. Uh, and I think that it is important uh, that sensitivity is applied on what are very, very personal and difficult and indeed heartbreaking decisions, because I believe that all of these couples want to have the child in the first place. These are not people who are uh, wanting to engage in, in some uh, form of, of dispensing of a, of a pregnancy because uh, it was uh, something they hadn't planned. Uh, so we need to deal with all of these cases in a very, very sensitive way and give due consideration um, to everything that has been said to us. Ian Miller. Mr. Miller. Mr. Uh, can call your, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister uh, what, the, what impact has the new wing at Anthem Area Hospital have had on uh, waiting times in the NE? Well, I think that not just the, the new wing, but um, w there has been a change in the management team and the management structure there. And I think that together it has made a massive impact um, on the Antrim area hospital. Uh, at the end of September, there were 109,000 people waiting for outpatient appointments, um, which uh, is down by 21,000. But in terms of Antrim, um, 79 people waited longer than 12 hours in ED in September. And while 79 is too many, it has been the lowest number that there has been over the past four years. And I think we can see that Antrim Hospital isn't in the headlines. And that's a very positive thing because Antrim Hospital was in the headlines very often for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, I think that if it's, uh, uh, the fact that it's not in the headlines is an indication uh, that the public are, are much more satisfied with the service that has been provided at that site. In um, my wake is done era, Gucci, uh, done a Fergary, Gucci show. Uh, could I ask the Minister then, um, is there any other measures being brought forward to further decrease waiting times? Uh, any new thinking in those regards, uh, the figures that you have already stated? Well, 
Well, I think the measures that are being taken is that people are on the ground um, day and daily working very close uh, with, 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 uh, with the people in Antrim, hus uh, uh, in Antrim Hospital. And I should clarify that 79 wasn't the, the number for Antrim, or the number, that was the number for Northern Ireland as an entirety. Um, Antrim was our worst hospital in terms of 12 hour breaches some time ago, and uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, so it has been performing remarkably well, and uh, I welcome the fact that people are actually on the ground talking to the staff, uh, hearing what the problems are, uh, addressing those problems quickly. And as a consequence of that, the public are seeing um, a service which has improved vastly. And uh, we will continue to work with uh, the Northern Trust to ensure that uh, improvement continues uh, into the future. Order, members, that includes questions to the Health Minister. Mr. Wells.